Hello, and welcome back to Off the Deaton Path. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for April 14th, 2022. We are broadcasting this week from the Documentary Film Division here at the Georgia Historical Society on the 15th floor of the Jepson House, overlooking beautiful Forsyth Park in downtown Savannah. My special guest on this week's podcast is Dayton Duncan, an award-winning documentary filmmaker, author, and historian who has worked closely with Ken Burns over the last 30 years to produce some of the most important and critically acclaimed historical documentaries in film and broadcast history. You will hear much more about Dayton Duncan in my interview with him, but he is the author of 13 books, including Out West, A Journey Through Lewis and Clark's America, which chronicles his retracing of the Lewis and Clark Trail, Miles from Nowhere, In Search of the American Frontier, Examining the Current Conditions, History, and People of the Most Sparsely Settled Counties in the United States, and Seed of the Future, Yosemite, and the Evolution of the National Park Idea. Working with Ken Burns and his production company, Florentine Films, Dayton served as co-writer and consulting producer on The West, a 12-hour series about the history of the American West, He was the writer and producer of Lewis and Clark, The Journey of the Corps of Discovery, a four-hour documentary broadcast in 1997. He co-wrote and produced the four-hour film bio of Mark Twain in 2001, and in 2003, Horatio's Drive, about the first transcontinental automobile trip. In 2009, he wrote and produced The National Parks, America's Best Idea, which won two Emmy Awards. He also wrote and produced The Dust Bowl, a 2012 two-part series about the worst man-made ecological disaster in American history. Dayton wrote and served as lead producer of Country Music, a 16-hour series broadcast in 2019. He also served as a consultant or consulting producer on all of Ken Burns' other documentaries, beginning with The Civil War in 1990 and including 1994's Baseball, Jazz in 2001, The War about World War II in 2007, and 2017's The Vietnam War. His most recent collaboration was as writer of Benjamin Franklin, a four-hour documentary that aired in April on PBS. This interview was recorded at the Georgia Historical Society's Research Center on April 4, 2022. Here's Dayton Duncan. Dayton Duncan, welcome to our podcast. Uh, It's great to be here. Now, you are known to our audience uh, as a both uh, the writer uh, and producer and face on many documentaries that they have seen on public broadcasting and in other places, uh, mainly produced by Ken Burns. You've been collaborating with him for a long time, and I want to talk about that. But first, let's back all the way up to your birth. Tell me where you were born. I was born in a little town called Indianola, Iowa. It's about 20 miles south of Des Moines, and... Uh, Grew up in that little town, went to grade school and high school there, and uh, spent part of the summers out on my grandfather's and uncle's farm, and uh, then went east to college. And how did your, how would you say your Midwestern upbringing uh, really, what impact did that have on the work you did for the rest of your life? Huh, that's a good question. I, I, in retrospect, I think one of the formative moments of my life when I was, um, Nine years old, my family, uh, both my parents worked, and we didn't um, couldn't afford real vacations per se. You know, when my dad had time off, he'd paint the house. Uh, occasionally, we'd go uh, up and go fishing in uh, Minnesota, but we took one real vacation when I was nine years old. And my mom, we decided to go to national parks to the west in South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, and so forth. And my mom least led me to the impression that I was kind of instrumental in trying to plan this. And so I sent off, this was before the internet, uh, this 1959, uh, and I sent off to all these states and got their travel brochures and maps and looked through those things and said, oh, I think we ought to go here and we ought to go here and we ought to go here. And she'd also said, we're going to go to national parks for two reasons, that she thought they were important, but mainly because we could afford it. And um, looking back on it, um, you know, that experience of going out into the Great Plains in South Dakota, seeing the Badlands and seeing the Black Hills, going to what was then called Custer's Battlefield, now uh, a Little Bighorn National uh, Battlefield's historic site, 
Um, Yellowstone National Park, Grand Tetons National Park, Dinosaur National I can still walk you through almost <laughs> day to day of it. And um, I don't know. I think that opened up a, a whole different world to me, both in terms of the physicality of the space of this nation and also its history, mm-hmm. you know. I, we were we were going along in the little Bighorn battlefield, and I looked uh, I looked down on the ground near, near where my dad was standing. I said, "Wait, Dad, don't stop! Look, there's an arrowhead." And I reached down and picked it up, and I I was pretty sure that was probably either crazy horses or sitting bulls. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I was a father myself that I realized my dad had bought it at the <laughs> gift store and sort of dropped it right before he sort of drew my attention. Um, over there, but it opened up this whole new prospect for me. And now, as I look back on my life, uh, much of my professional life as a writer and a filmmaker has been about those two things: the physicality, the ge- the sheer size and geography of the United States, and what that meant to us as a as a nation, and this, you know, both physical and metaphoric journey that our nation has undergone, mostly from east to west, um, and how that showed up in the choices I made on the first books that I was writing, uh, the choices that I made in encouraging films that um, Ken has done. Um, so I, I don't know. You know, if you're if you're from the Middle West, you're in the middle there, right? And so. <laughs> You, you, it's hard to be provincial in, in one sense. You're provincial in the sense that you live in a little town. Uh, going east to Philadelphia to college was a, a shock to me. But um, but you're in the middle, and so you're interested in north, south, east, and west of you because that's where a lot of the stuff is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that has uh, – influenced me a lot it also influenced in this respect is that i i'm uh, and i learned this going to school in philadelphia is that i'm a small town kid you know i know the pros and cons of living in a small town where there are no secrets everybody knows you but at the same time everybody knows you um and uh chose over the my adult life that i prefer living in small towns than in big cities did your did the love of the physicality in the in the West did that translate into a love of the outdoors throughout your life? Do you enjoy being outside and in, in experiencing things like, for instance, Lewis the Clark experience? Yeah, I mean, I I I wouldn't I wouldn't overstate that I'm an outdoorsman in the sense that I you know I've camped a lot and uh, uh, been in every single one of the national parks mm. when I was working on some of many of which I'd been to working on books and many of them and then uh, and then all of them when we uh, doing the film on the national parks so I love being out there I also like taking a shower and having a hot breakfast so uh, you know <laughs> if if you can find that sweet spot or if you're going to be out camping mm-hmm. if you can do it with an outfitter and so you don't have to be worried during the day, where the heck are we going to be camping tonight? Mm-hmm. And what are we having for dinner, supper? Um, and will there be hot coffee in the morning? And maybe the smell of bacon frying. Uh, that's the that's that's my kind of outdoors uh, experience. <laughs> I should tell our audience too that uh, you are now a, a part time resident of Georgia. I am of Savannah. Diane and I, uh, my wife, came down here in March of 2018 just to get away from the rigors of the New Hampshire winter for a month. Um, She was really tired of the dark and the cold and the ice, particularly she had slipped on the ice and had a concussion the year before, and two years before that I had done the same thing. So she said, we're getting at an age we probably ought to stay away from the ice as much as possible, and she selected... uh, savannah to come and i was writing the companion book for um for the country music uh film at the time and so i said as long as it's got a place that's got a porch that i can sit on and write in the mornings and smoke my pipe i'm a pipe smoker and i'm not allowed to smoke the pipe inside uh but it's a habit that is particularly connected in my mind to writing um then 
that sounds fine. We were here for a month, and while I was riding, Diane was walking through this wonderful city, and in the afternoon would take me to the places she'd been visiting, and before we knew it, we were looking for a place to live, and I'm a guy for whom, you know, an impulse buy is a second Snickers bar, but before we left here at a month, we had made a deposit on a little row house uh, in the historic district, and we try to spend as much of the winter as we can here. We love the city. It's uh, it's just enchanting. It's a great, great place. There's so much going on. Our son um, has just taken an apartment here. He's an aspiring singer-songwriter. He's been helping me on the last couple of films, um, and he's hoping to get connected to the music scene. Some of his compositions have uh, appeared in some of our films that uh, we've made and quite a few of them in the Ben Franklin film that's just come out um, but so we're connected to it and uh, he loves it we love it our our daughter who's older than will um, lives in um, between New England and and California but um, she loves it down here too and you're here from from when to when Oh, we uh, this year we're here from January uh, into mid-April. Uh, we're hoping next year perhaps to come down in November and maybe have Christmas here and Thanksgiving and stay, you know, into late April. And, uh, you know, it makes sense to be here in those months uh, and not here in the months uh, in between when we can be in New Hampshire where I, it's glorious. I was going to say, your other home is Walpole, New Hampshire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I want to talk about how you learned and honed the craft of writing, uh-huh. which you which you did a lot of. So you go uh, from Iowa to you said east to college. Where'd you go to college? I went to uh, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and I studied German literature for reasons I can't even recall. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, after I graduated, I moved to New Hampshire. Um, I was a conscientious objector. I did I did two years of alternative service working in a hospital in uh, New Hampshire. And when that was over, I was originally planning to go to graduate school in American literature, but instead had gotten a part-time job on a newspaper. And I realized how much I loved being a reporter. I loved going out and finding things out, interviewing people, mm. I loved researching into things. I really loved uh, the challenge of trying to then write a story that is, you know, accurate, um, flows, um, and in certain instances can be either entertaining or compelling, uh, but not necessarily has to be that. Um, And I loved, I'll be honest, loved seeing my byline on the front page of a newspaper. So I was a newspaper man for about eight years, uh, you know, moved my way up to being a, a, a editor. I wrote a smart aleck column, that a weekly column that about 17 papers in northern New England carried. Um, then went into writing freelance um, articles. Um, and, um, you know, what I... Um, and then I went. In, I, I was then went back and forth with uh, politics. I was the chief of staff for a governor of New Hampshire for two terms. I worked for Walter Mondale on his presidential campaign as his uh, deputy, essentially traveling press secretary for a year and a half. I did the same thing for Michael Dukakis in 1984 and 1988. That's right. Mm-hmm. And they both lost. Not to give it away, uh, <laughs> but that 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 that. that provides you with a lot of extra time to go back to writing, which is what I did. And so then I moved from writing magazine articles to writing books. When did you write your first book? My first book called Out West is about my retracing of the Lewis and Clark Trail. Um, I did a magazine story in 1983 and then got a book contract that I then retraced it again uh, to get more material in uh, after Mondale lost in 85, and it came out in 87. So that was my, that was my first book. And, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I think it was my uh, time in politics that really ignited my passion for history. I was interested in it before that, but I wasn't passionate about it. 
But being in a place where you're trying to make decisions and you don't know what the outcome was going to be, you really feel like, well, this is actually what history is. It's human beings, you know, not knowing what tomorrow will will bring, uh, nonetheless having to confront it yeah. and uh, and making decisions, some of which turn out for the better and some of them blow up in your face. Um, and that... Uh, reignited my rereading of history, and somebody gave me a one volume edition of the Lewis and Clark journals, and I was hooked from the start. And I saw in Meriwether Lewis, who had been the chief assistant to President Jefferson, something of myself, also long winded when he wrote. Uh, but um, uh, so I went out, decided to go out along their trail and see what they would have found you know, almost 200 years after their historic um, expedition and turned that into a book. So did you take canoe trips and all of this? I did. I mean, I I wasn't trying to replicate their experience. I I was trying to say, okay, if they were leaving today and I had the same instructions that Meriwether Lewis had from Thomas Jefferson, go out, see what the country's like, who are the people there, what does it look like, what are their customs? Um, So my book, Out West, operates on three tracks. One is... um, if I'm in South Dakota, you know, where they encountered uh, native people and uh, uh, buffalo beyond uh, counting, um, I need to tell that that story. Then I need to tell the people that I met and the fact that there's only a couple of places that had a buffalo ranch. And then the third track is, well, what happened between their journey and mine? So that got me into the history of, mm. of the West. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, um, while most of my books and all of my films have been historical, I, I can still consider myself a reporter. I, I didn't get to interview Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. They died 200 years early mm-hmm. for, th- for that. But I apply the same um, process, if you will, to writing a book or writing a film that I did as a reporter. I, I'm just curious. I want to learn everything I can about it, which in the case of history means reading a lot. I use my reporting skills to go talk to historians or other people who've lived through a, a part of history to learn as much as I can from them. I need to go to the places where the history occurred, which has also been a joy of my itinerant life. Um, and then I have the same challenge that I had when I was, you know, trying to make the deadline for that day's newspaper. You know, I got to write it, and I got to try to write it that it's, you know, that it's factual, first of all, um, that it's clear, hopefully, and that um, it brings the past to life by reminding you that while we we all knew that Lewis and Clark got back. They didn't know they were all they're going to get back, and to try to keep that part of the contingency of history mm-hmm. um, alive in the story that that you're telling. How and I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Lewis and Clark, particularly Meriwether Lewis uh-huh. and your involvement in that documentary. Which brings us to tell me how you met, got involved with Ken Burns. Well, I was as I said earlier, I was the chief of staff for uh, the governor of New Hampshire in the late seventies, Hugh Gallon. Uh, was his name, and um, this young guy uh, called up and said that his name was Ken Burns, and he had moved recently moved seventy nine had recently moved to New Hampshire, uh, and he had a uh, freelance job for the BBC with four questions they wanted the governor of New Hampshire to be asked on camera. It was about we had started a process of trying to reinvigorate some of the old mill towns. Uh, of New Hampshire, which the mills had left, but the mills were, I mean, the working mills had left, but the buildings were still there. And how do you reinvigorate um, those downtowns with other economic um, activity? And so they had some questions that they wanted him um, to to answer. And so I set it up. If you wanted to see the governor of New Hampshire in those days, you had to go through me. And uh, so this Guy shows up, and he walks in, says, I'm Ken Burns, and he looked like he was probably an intern. Uh, and um, 
So while he was getting set up, we were talking, and he said he just moved to Walpole, New Hampshire, and he was working on a film about the Brooklyn Bridge. And I remember thinking, well, you know, as a writer myself and everything, I thought, well, that's about it. I didn't say this to him, but I said, well, that's that's a dry topic, the building of a bridge. And if the if you're making a film about the building of a bridge in Brooklyn, why are you in New Hampshire? He was there because it was cheaper to live in, in, in New Hampshire. But anyway, <laughs> so that's how we first met. And then a year later, he called me up. Um, we were going to, the governor and I were going to be going to the Academy Awards that year because we had also started a film bureau, which had attracted On Golden Pond to come to New Hampshire to be filmed. And it was nominated for Academy Awards. We were using that publicity to try to encourage other film companies to come to New Hampshire. That was in the newspaper. And I got a call and said, hi, this is, uh, I don't know if you remember, my name's Ken Burns, I said, I, thought, I said, yeah, I remember you. And I thought the guy was going to make a film about a bridge, for God's sake. He said, I just want you to know that I finished that film and it's been nominated for an Academy Award. <laughs> and we're going to be out showing, uh, doing a showing, and it'd be great if the governor of our my adopted state could come to us. I said, absolutely. So we became friends. Did you uh, watch it and then change your mind about it? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great film. Uh, uh, and the genius of, of Ken, both in terms of the conception and the execution of it, was evident from that uh, very first film. So it turned out we had uh, mutual interest. We both have a passion for the American story. Uh, we learned as we became friends. Uh, I was re- starting my family, and he was starting his, and we learned that we both read the Declaration of Independence aloud to our eye-rolling children every Independence Day because we both have this um, deep belief in the words of the founding document and a deep curiosity and passion for the story of this journey this experiment in democracy that began then and the un, you know, unfinished journey uh, that's gone in fits and starts with stumbles and errors, but, but, but also some great triumphs, um, that we we're just fascinated by that and all the different aspects um, of that. And so I was writing books at that time, and I'd let him read my manuscripts and he was making other films and he'd bring me in just to sit and watch a um, a screening of one in progress and I would tell him not as an expert on the topic but I'd say you know I was confused here or this is really good this stuff right here is really good and you ought to do the more that you can do of this this kind of stuff the the you know the better um, and over time um, I sent him a list of of story ideas. I'd moved out to Kansas for a while and was working on my third book called Miles from Nowhere about the most sparsely settled counties in the United States, but all in the West. And I sent him a list of um, film ideas. Um, and um, he came out to visit for uh, a while and uh, he said, I-, I think I'm going to do this one on the West that you're, you're doing, but if I'm going to do it, I want you to be involved in it as well. And so by happenstance, I switched from just writing books to becoming, you know, because I knew the West very well. I've been traveling it for, by that point, 10 years. Um, I knew the places to go film. I knew many of the historians that ought to be interviewed. Um, and I got involved and became the co-writer and a consulting producer on that. And um, then we went on from then. And, and, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I'm just very lucky. Uh, the films that I, uh, well, I, I've uh, since that time I've just been, generally been a consultant on films that I'm not writing and producing with Ken, um, in that same capacity of coming and sitting down, and looking at it, or reading a script by Jeff Ward and say, "Here's my two cents worth." But the ones that I write and produce are ones that I suggested, um, and I produce the ones I write and write the ones I produce uh, on topics that I'm either already somewhat conversant on and passionate about or powerfully curious about and want to learn more. And I I like to describe it sort of as a self-directed postgraduate degree in the topic of my choice. And, you know, it's the best, 
it's been uh, you know i kept i've kept waiting for 30 years now for someone to tap me on the shoulder and say wait a minute it says here on this clipboard that you graduated uh, in german literature and you've been doing the wrong thing here now for 30 years and so now you've got to go do something else but you're an imposter uh, yeah you're an imposter sure yeah now for our audience um tell us uh what which those were that you suggested and that you were so sure. intimately involved with uh, well, The West, a big series that came out in 1996. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lewis and Clark, The Journey of the Corps of Discovery, came out in 1997. Uh, Mark Twain, biography of the great writer, um, came out, I think, 2000 uh, or 2001, I guess. Uh, a short film called Horatio's Drive about the first automobile trip across the United States in 1903. Just a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, that that sort of heralds in a new century for America, uh, particularly with the automobile taking center stage. Um, the National Parks, America's Best Idea, uh, The Dust Bowl, mm-hmm. and then most recently um, the big series on country music, and now um, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Which I think debuts, and I will tell our audience we are recording on Monday, April 4th. I think it deb- debuts tonight. Yes, it's, it'll be broadcast uh, uh, nationally tonight and tomorrow night. It's two episodes, and then streamed mm-hmm. you know, constantly um, uh, for people who want to catch up to it. And we'll be rebroadcast, as all of our films are, on public uh, broadcasting stations mm-hmm. fairly repeatedly and, and, uh, and for many years. Lewis and Clark still gets broadcast every year by lots of stations 30 years after the fact. Tell our audience, <clears throat> if you will, very briefly, I think everyone has a general idea of what a writer does. Uh-huh. What does a producer do on something like this? Well, you know, uh, producers do a lot of... Uh, producers do uh, everything that's necessary for uh, the writer to have the material that he or she needs to... Uh, to write a script uh, provides uh, all the things that are necessary for the filming to take place, um, all the details uh, of it. And sometimes that can be specific things. Some producers would would be, you know, uh, for us would be looking specifically for the still images all across the country on national parks, for instance, or country music. Where, where the, where the great phrase, uh, yep. mining the archives. Mm-hmm. Uh, another producer might be leading the production team to go do the interviews with the uh, experts that that we interview, or in the case of the Dust Bowl, finding the survivors of the Dust Bowl who have stories uh, to tell and getting the film crew there and arranging, you know, um, all, all of that getting the permits that are required it's it's the you know it, it's it's a big job and if you're the lead producer as i was that means you're in, you're in charge of all of it and you know delegating to other people some of the details but making sure that all those details are in fact um paid attention to and managing a budget and um all those things you you, you have to make those kind of decisions you know over the course of in some of our instances, almost 10 years of work, mm-hmm. you know, to finally um, have it all come to a, a, a conclusion and get ready to be presented to PBS and then aired uh, on the PBS station. So it's it's a it's a it's a very big job. Ken is always the executive producer of our films, meaning he's the, that that in our parlance means. He's, he's responsible for making sure that the money is raised, although in some of the projects I've done, I've helped on, on that as well. He's also a producer, though he designates one person as the, the lead producer so he doesn't have to spend all of his time worrying about all those myriad details. And so that's what what I've done on, on the projects I work worked on. And then he's also the director, meaning that when we get into the editing room, um, while it's a very collaborative process, if it really comes down to a vote, he's got 51%, and everybody else aggregately has 49%. Mm-hmm. But um, but it's a, you know, the difference between the writing and the producing is the writing is not a collaborative enterprise. And I love that portion of it. It's just like I was when I was a reporter. I loved the that part of uh, of every project, learning it, the challenge of writing it. 
I also loved as wearing my producer hat, being responsible for meeting the people that who who knows the most about um, country music, finding those people and interviewing them. With national parks, my quote job was to go to all the national parks. Can you beat that? Uh, and I, I and, remember when that one came out, everybody just thought this was, I mean, everybody wanted to go, Yeah, you know, and I thought somebody did. Yeah. Somebody, <laughs> so that I, was and you. that was you, uh, that was me and the camera crew and, and sometimes Ken. And, and so it was sort of home movies for me. I mean, each of those shots, wonderful shots that you would see in the film, I, I could still remember that morning in, you know, uh, in a Denali national park and the sunrise that came up on, uh, Mount Denali, and uh, now was he present for those, or did you do those? He he, I, I was there for ninety eight percent of them. Uh, when we finally got down to editing, we sent a crew out to do some helicopter shots, uh, but I was there for all the others. And he would, you know, he's generally got three or four projects going simultaneously. Mm-hmm. The ones that I produce, I would try to make sure that three or four important of uh, of the film of the film trips were in a way that that his schedule would allow him to come. He loves nothing more than doing that. It's just that he's got other duties sure. on, on other projects. Yeah, uh, and Sunrise so, and Sunset shots in all of the documentaries are just fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, as Ken says, God is our lighting director. Uh, you know, we we the morning light is the best light, and the sun, you know, the evening, the gloaming is... Uh, as John Muir would have called it, is also a beautiful light. The shadows are longer, the colors are different, and the things stand out more. And so, you know, if you're shooting National Parks or when we were shooting Lewis and Clark, you know, if you're in Montana and it's June and you want to be out on the Missouri River um, uh, or out on the plains, in a remote part of the West at sunrise. Well, the sunrise is at four thirty, and we try to be in place at least 45 minutes ahead of time. And if you want to be there when the sun sets, that's like at nine. And by the time you get back to your motel room, it's like midnight mm-hmm. and you got to get up at three the next morning to get back out there. Mm-hmm. But long as those days are, you know, I, I would always just, and sometimes you're skunked. I mean, sometimes, you know, God decides that not today, I guess, boys. Um, Send a cloud. That, yeah, that it's just going to be kind of crappy light. Um, but, you know, we'd get deathly tired, and and if, if Ken was with us or or not, but I'd light up my pipe and do a little pre-dawn ceremony to, to the four directions and uh, just say, if we don't shoot anything, we were still here. For a exactly. sunrise, yeah, you you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> still pretty good day. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. I don't know. I, when I use the word job, I have to put quotation marks around it. I remember particularly at the end of Thomas Jefferson, as Jefferson, it's a great quote. As it, literally the end of the documentary, the sun is going down behind the mountain. Yeah, uh, what a fantastic shot that was. Yeah, we you know we're fortunate. We have uh, a guy named Buddy Squires who's been our principal cinematographer since the founding of Florentine Films in the mid seventies. He went to college with Ken, mm. and uh, was one of the original founders of Florentine Films, and then decided to specialize more in the thing that he is. Uh, without question, one of the great cinematographers in cinematography. So he still does the stuff for us, Mm -hmm. but he also does it for a lot of other people. How hard is it to get Ken Burns to uh, like one of your ideas? Tell us how that works. (laughs) Do you sit around a room like this and kick things around? I had the fortune to meet him uh, as the war was debuting. I met him in Atlanta at Georgia Public Broadcasting at a luncheon, and I asked him, you know, when are you going to do the American Revolution, which was my particular uh, thing I was interested in, he said that he had kind of done it with Jefferson, and of course now many years later he's done it with Benjamin Franklin that's coming out. But he said, you know, a lot of it has to do with the visual part of it, uh-huh. um, that, that you have to be able to illustrate what it is you're talking about. Um, and so I thought that was interesting because it was just a little glimpse into yeah. the creative process. But tell us how that works. Do you pitch an idea and he's like, boy, I like that, or does he shoot it down? And he's like, hey, let's do World War One. No, I don't want to do I'm not interested. Yeah, it's it's more informal than formal, I would say. You know, he's got what we would call a Florentine Films family and uh, a lot of very creative uh, people, each of whom often have ideas of great topics. Um, 
certainly in my case, you know, uh, there are these ones that I wanted, I thought we ought to make, and that I wanted, if we were making it, I wanted to be the one um, uh, to do it. Um, generally, it needs to be about Mer American history. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, so with national parks, I came up with the idea that we ought to do a series on national parks, and it was not going to be a travelogue or a nature show. It was about the national park idea, which to me is the Declaration of Independence applied to the landscape. Only in a nation founded on something like the Declaration of Independence would ultimately come to the conclusion that the most majestic and sacred places in a landscape should be preserved not for the royal for royalty or the rich or the well-connected as it had been from time immemorial in every nation but in our nation we finally said no those special places need to be saved for all time for everyone and that was as radical an idea when it happened in the mid 19th century as the declaration of independence was radical a century earlier. And so my thought was, I want to approach these places with that, this, this, this idea, and also that we take the places for granted. But if you turn over the rock of any national park, what you discover in that story is the opposite of what we think. It's not from the top down. It's somebody who fell in love with the place or a group of people who fell in love with the place so desperately that they wanted it preserved so that other people in generations they would never know or meet could have that same experience. That's what I wanted to get across. And um, because our natural inclination is not to preserve, it's right? To build, pay. Our our, our national history is not one of saving those things. It's mm -hmm. paving them, as you say, or that beautiful river. Let's dam it. Oh, those mountains. Maybe there's precious metals underneath that forest. Forest needs to be cut down. You know, um, that's the basic part of our history. But another part of our history is that, at least on occasions, to step back and say, no, uh, let's save it. But anyway, so um, I you know, thought about it and I went and sat down with Ken. And I said, okay, I've got this idea for, uh, an, uh, for a film series. And I said, it's the National Parks. And it's, it's, it was the, f the first... Uh, uh, expression of it was in the midst of the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln, his favorite president, uh, decided to set aside Yosemite uh, Valley, though they entrusted it with the state at the first. Um, and But it's also an expression of the Declaration of Independence. He'd done a film about Thomas Jefferson, and, it's, and, then, and I started to say, and then, but it's got all these other things. Says, Let's do it. So I don't know. It took me, I don't know. 45 seconds to a minute and a half. Horatio's drive, I started um, suggesting to him, uh, well, it took uh, almost eight or nine years to finally get him to agree on that because he just wasn't quite sure. And then uh, working with my wife, Diane, also a former reporter, we uncovered the letters that Horatio Nelson Jackson sent to his wife after he bought a car, made a bet in San Francisco that a car could actually be driven across the United States. It had never happened before. Um, and found the letters uh, that he wrote, and so Ken um, agreed to do that. And so that, if you average that, it took about five years then between what it took for, for that and the minute and a half. Uh, you know, I gave him the autobiography of, of Benjamin Franklin in 1992, and I said, sometime you should do a film about this fella. And so that's 30 years ago. I think the thing that prompted him more to finally do it was that he had dinner with Walter Isaacson, the, wrote the great biography of it. Mm -hmm. But I still claim that I pr proposed it in 1992, and uh, we're going to be doing a film about the American Buffalo, which I proposed in 1989 so it's got a so obviously he's got a sign he's got a sign on to him and he's got to figure that it's um that it's a worthwhile uh film that helps us in this quest that we have of of trying to tell the american story through biography through characters through story 
that are significant moments or significant people or interesting uh, ways of looking at who we are as Americans and taken all together then, all those films uh, create a tapestry of, you know, of the American experience. And a lot of times we go over th- a certain area of time but from a d- little different angle. You know, we did the Dust Bowl. It took place in the 1930s. It's both an environmental story and an economic story and a story of great suffering and of human um, misguidedness of plowing up a place that shouldn't have been plowed up, uh, of er- human arrogance, but also human suffering and also human perseverance that takes place during the Great Depression. Well, we also have done stories about the national parks, and part of that history is what were they like during the Great Depression. So that's a little, you know, mm-hmm. you, you're getting a little different angle. And then he did a, a history of all the Roosevelt. So once again, you've got the Depression, but you're sort of encountering that through Eleanor and and Franklin. And he does baseball and jazz, all of those things. You're still coming across some of these uh, eras of American history, but you got you know you're just deepening, aggreg- aggregating and deepening your uh, storytelling and your understanding um, of these moments in history and getting to know different people uh, and their involvement in that. And they have to be visual too. I mean, this is the, yeah. their films. At the end yeah, of the day, but I do to want to tell you that uh, right now they're uh, probably even even as we're speaking, there's probably a film crew somewhere out uh, filming places for a five-episode history of the American Revolution going on right now uh-huh. that, that Ken plans to bring out in uh, 2025. Oh, excellent. That's yeah, so he's doing it. But it does it does create these problems. Yeah. Uh, we faced it, in Je- uh, he faced it in Jefferson, we faced it in Lewis and Clark, you know, inconsiderate to uh, future film documentarians by leaving on their expedition 40 years before the invention of photography. <laughs> but in that one, each each one is its own challenge. So with Lewis and Clark, we realized we can't look into their eyes as he had just done with Civil War. Civil War had no photographs of battles taking place. And he had to come up, they had to come up with ways to, you know, make you feel like you're there at that battle, but without photographs of the battle itself. But you could look at all those glorious uh, glass plate negative photographs of the post-battle or the pre-battle, all the people who participated in it and or died in it. With Lewis and Clark, we realize we cannot look into their eyes, but we can stand next to Meriwether Lewis or William Clark hear what he had to say about this place and look at what at the landscape and was an ever-changing landscape over the course of two and a half years so we could be with them and then it doesn't seem like we're just endlessly vamping uh visually with uh with franklin you know there are lots of paintings and drawings of him uh, there are maps. There are, you know, some historic places. But there, there it was. There are all these visual challenges that you have to, that you have to face. And for us, that's part of the joy of what we do. I mean, we we don't like to go into a story to say I already know what this story is, and I'm just now going to go out and illustrate it. For us, it's going out and learning what the story is, and then coming back with excitement and say, let me tell you the story now and let's say okay and now what can we use the words of the people who lived it um the uh diaries or the newspaper accounts and what can we use to help because it is a visual medium what can we do and that's a challenge but it's not a a burden for us let's talk a little bit about lewis and clark because i think uh, you, you, as you said, you wrote a book about it. This was a very personal story for you. I mean, yeah. our, 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 our listeners will remember uh, 
you appeared on screen on that one, you, as yep. you did in the national parks as well. But, uh, I mean, one of the most vivid memories of that was your telling about Meriwether Lewis's death. Yeah. All of our viewers, I mean, I remember still and, uh, you know, was so moved by your talking about it and how much it moved you to almost 200 years later as you yeah. told the story. Meriwether Lewis was, we now know, and you can tell this, um, he suffered from depression, yeah. un, undiagnosed, I think, at that yeah. time, clearly misunderstood. But uh, that was a very, very, uh, it was moving for you to tell, clearly. Yeah. That, that whole story was, was a very personal one for you. Yeah. Well, um, um, my kids call me the waterworks, you know, um, and Ken calls me uh, a, a play on a, on a term in New England, the town crier, the person who brings you the news, but he says, you're the Walpole's town crier. Uh, I, 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 you know, I get, uh, I throw myself into these projects. I felt that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark and York and Sacagawea are all friends of mine. I mean, I just spent so much time, particularly on the Lewis and Clark story. I've written three books about it since 1983, not a year has gone by that I haven't gone somewhere out along the trail. So it's, 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 it's embedded in my bloodstream. Um, but I get, that, I get that wrapped up on the other projects I do. I mean, I, I, it's just, uh, and um, I've always wished that I was better able at uh, uh, not, you know, keeping the waterworks uh in check and uh my wife and uh my kids used to be embarrassed by it but they they've gotten they've gotten over it but um it is it does become personal to me or it, it just there's something about the about the pathos or something about uh, you know it can also be a triumphant moment and I'll uh, I'll get misty eyed uh and it's just because you know, I've worked so hard at trying to write a script or a book that tries to put you in the place of those people. Um, and um, that I've, you know, that they become friends, even though uh, two centuries separate us. Or sometimes not even they're friends, they're just acquaintances, but I still feel that moment. Um, it demonstrates a strong connection to the past, to these people as people. It yeah, seems to me. yeah. I, I, you know, I think so. I mean, I, I firmly, when I was working on Lewis and Clark, my first book, and then on the West, um, I'm a firm believer that uh, a geographic space, you know, exists not only in the coordinates of longitude and latitude of north and south miles this way or that way it is it also exists in layers of time so a, a, a point on the you know if you go to south pass in wyoming and stand there particularly in some of those places that have not necessarily changed that much from the time that some of their you know the reason that we remember them occurred um you can stand there and understand and feel or at least imagine what it must have been like for the mormons who went through there on their fleeing persecution in missouri and looking for their zion in the deserts of utah or you can feel what it must have been like for people on the Oregon Trail going through that same place, you know, 15 miles a day if at most, trying to reach a better, you know, tomorrow, or what it would have been, must have been like for indigenous people for whom this was had always been home and watching all this parade of, of, of intruders mm. coming through your, Homeland, and that's what uh, always intrigues me is just trying to come to grips with that, and that, and that historical characters are human beings with the same um, 
failings and emotions, aspirations, some of which get crushed and some might su- succeed a- as we are. We, you know, we are part of, you know, history is happening right now, right? Just hold your breath for a second and that breath is now the past and the future is coming from a, from the new direction uh, to you. And, um, you know, like with Lewis and Clark, they if you're trying to c- cross a continent that you didn't really understand just how damn big it is with mountains that you didn't even know existed and you're trying to do that against a river, mighty river, and it's current for, uh, for the westward journey, day after day after day, you know, their, their most common phrase in their journal was, we proceeded on. So how do you cross a continent at 12 miles a day? You know, one step at a time. One step at a time. We proceeded on. And not knowing if you're going to succeed, not knowing if you're all going to perish. Um, you know, that's the advantage of history is that you know how it turns out. The challenge of telling the history is to try to take people back with you to that moment and and be with them with the unknowingness of how that's going to turn out. I mean, that's also good drama, but we do history not to be doing drama. We do history to help us understand history. Mm -hmm. But understanding history has to be understanding the contingencies of it. It wasn't inevitable that it was going to turn out this way. It just wasn't. If we think it was, we are fools. Uh, But how do you try to communicate that to people without just preaching as I just did? We we just try to demonstrate it. Mm -hmm. So what is next for Dayton Duncan? What project are you working on? What do you got coming up? What are you you're excited about? Well, uh, you know, we, the Franklin film has not yet been broadcast, so I'm excited uh, that that will finally, this, mm-hmm. you know, child. I always think you, you with a film, you you it's like you're having a child and getting it up to so it can walk and then setting it loose in heavy traffic. You know, I just want to see, is it going to get run over? Or are people going to say, oh, what a beautiful little boy or girl this is? You know, uh, so I'm always interested in, uh, will it reach people? Um, will it have um, the effect that I would hope it be? It would. I've been uh, working now uh, for a year and a half as well on writing the script, and I've written the early drafts of a script on the American Buffalo film that will come out either in 2023 or 2024. It's the story of <clears throat> the most magnificent animal on the North American continent, uh, the bison, the American buffalo. Um, and it's the story of its connection with the original people of North America, how it once existed in seemingly uncountable numbers. There were, there were, there, there were buffalo here in Georgia in the 1700s, mm. um, most of them on the plains, but they were as far east as here and as far north as the Great Lakes. Um, but then uh, the story, the tragic story of this collision of two views of, of human beings' relationship to the natural world between the native people and the newcomers from Europe um, and how that finally played out in the middle of the 19th century with taking uh, a species that existed in the tens of millions to the brink of extinction. That's a tragic but important story to know. That Are we capable of doing that? Yes, we are as Americans. But the second half of that and lesser known and lesser told story, which is the second half of that film, is the different diverse groups of collections of people at different parts of the country who decided to try to save the bison from disappearing forever. They're a motley crew of people, believe me. Um, And they help us know this other story, just like the national parks did, you know, that people can 
work to prevent destruction and prevent disaster and to Im- in improve things. And I think that that's, um, that's a story that has a lot of resonance today. You know, are we capable of, of wrecking havoc on the natural world? You bet we are. Part of who we are as Americans is, you know, let's dam that river, let's do this, let's do that, you know. Um, but part of us, there's also a part that throws us back against that every once in a while, expressed in the national parks as well, to say, no, no, not here, not that bad. And we are capable um with the combination of grassroots um, passion and ultimately government wisdom of stepping back from uh, the brink. And I hope that, you know, not only tells us the story of the, what is now the national mammal, the buffalo, but also, uh, you know, has applications to other things that we face today. And then I hope to write some books. And then I'm then I th- at least I'm saying then I'm done making documentary films and I have a couple of book projects I don't want to talk about but that I would like to get get done before I cross the Great Divide. Well, I hope to see you in Savannah and maybe in the research center of the Georgia Historical Society, writing and researching. We're delighted to have you here, and I can't thank you enough for taking time to be. Well, here. I, I yeah. want to say that these the the historical society and and libraries and those things are this is where this is where the dna of who we are as a people is preserved uh and it's you know it's the they are so important and the work that the georgia historical society does of first of all preserving but secondly also helping to make uh, access to the story of 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 this of this place, as I said, I, I've come across things that I that I learned from looking through some of your stuff about the fact that the surprising fact that when Oglethorpe was first making his uh, here in Savannah, you know, trying to get Savannah and the colony of Georgia founded, had made a treaty with uh, Tamachichi of the uh, Yamacra uh, Indians, part of the Creek. Uh, an offshoot of the creeks, he was presented with a buffalo skin on which was painted uh, an eagle. And another creek chief brought to him a buffalo skin that had painted on it the migration or origin story, the migration story, according to the creeks, of who they were and where they came from on a buffalo skin. By 1759... The Provincial House of Commons voted to pass a law to say you can't hunt buffalo anymore. You, you, you're not supposed to hunt buffalo anymore in these certain parts of uh, uh, of the colony. It by eighteen the colony of Georgia, the colony of Georgia mm-hmm. by 1763, a different um, Creek chief was complaining to the governor uh, that the settlers were killing all the buffalo and destroying the habitat for it. Mm-hmm. And by uh, 1773, when William Bartron came through with, in his journeys, he said that he couldn't find any buffalo, but he, could, he heard stories about it and could see signs of it. You know? And that, in its own nutshell, is what happened to the buffalo uh, you know, mm-hmm. across... Uh, across the country absolutely wow what a great story well i look forward to uh to hearing more about that to seeing it uh in this upcoming documentary i wish you great luck with all the projects uh again thanks for taking time to be on our podcast oh it's my pleasure thanks for having me thanks dayton my thanks to dayton duncan for joining us on this podcast The hardest working producer and engineer in show business, the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS Mountain Unicycling Team, is our very own Brendan Cannonball Krellen. Our director of the GHS One Man Damn Yankees Fan Club is Keith Pinstripes Stragaro. 
Our GHS coordinator of classroom indoctrination is still Lisa War Eagle Landers. The GHS empress of the historical marker, don't call them monuments division, is Elise 135 words Butler. The director of the GHS ZZ Top Beard Division is Nate Sharp Dress Man Peterson. Our off the beaten path fact checker is Ella Fino. Our director of employee loyalty is Upton Leftus. Our staff director of Three Stooges Studies is Lee Iapoka. Our GHS bungee jumping instructor is Hugo First. Our staff cooks are Al Dente and Sal Manella. Dr. Todd Gross's personal eBay specialist is Selma Junkoff. And our Off the Deaton Path martini mixer is Olive Twist. If you have an iPhone, you can find our podcast at the App Store or on the podcast app on your phone and on Spotify. If you have an Android, look for us at Google Play. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Be sure and like Off the Deaton Path on Facebook as well. Please also visit deatonpath.georgiahistory.com and check out dispatches from Off the Deaton Path, my blog, and similarly made-for-television podcasts like this one. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society. As always, thank you for listening.